My name is Darlene Carby. I'm the chair of the English department, and I'm delighted to be introducing Dr. Scott Bowman today. I would like to remind everyone that next week um, we'll be hearing from Dr. Paul Fomisano um, when he gives his talk, which is titled Postwestern Considerations in Leslie Martin Silko's Ceremony. Um, but back to the more immediate Dr. Bowman, who's standing right here instead of hiding in the middle of the room. Um, <laughs> Dr. Bowman is the uh, coordinator of graduate studies for the Department of English, and his um, teaching interests focus mostly in contemporary American fiction, critical theory, magical realism, and postmodernism. And um, he is the co editor of the 2005 book called Ian Fleming and James Bond The Cultural Politics of James Bond. And his recently completed manuscript is titled Cold War Catastrophes, Western Intelligence Failures in Post-World War II Fiction. So we'll all be anxious to hear about the upcoming publication date of that. Um, Dr. Lowen's talk today is called Magical, uh, Magical Realism and Postmodernism, The Case of Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lowen. Darlene, and thank you for coming on this really steamy day. Um, anyway, uh, last week's talk on the Gothic and Amber Atkins, the Italian by Dr. Robinson, was a model of clarity. And I will at least set out today with that same spirit of clarity before losing myself in the morass of historical details about an Indian history with which I'm guessing most of us are unfamiliar. So I'd like to begin by briefly laying out the parameters of magical realism and the work of Salman Rushdie before delving into my argument proper uh, that explores the postmodern elements of Rushdie's most celebrated novel, The Next Children. And this will be all done in the context of the rival theories of postmodernism proposed by Frederick Jameson and Linda Hutchin. Uh, their debate concerns the relationship of history to postmodernism, and The Next Children presents an interesting text with which to explore the relevance of their arguments. So, first question, what is magical realism? Let us begin then with a Captain Obvious type claim regarding the definition of magical realism uh, that must nevertheless be made at the outset, and I will allow Stephen Slayman to make a point. The term magical realism is an oxymoron, one that suggests a binary opposition between the representational code of realism and that roughly of fantasy. In the language of narration in a magical realist text, a battle between two oppositional systems takes place, each working toward the creation of a different kind of fictional world for the other. Since the ground rules of these two worlds are incompatible, neither one can fully come into being, and each remains suspended, locked in a continuous dialectic with the other, a situation which creates disjunction within each of the separate discursive systems, rending them with gaps, absences, silences. Rushdie himself articulates a slightly more symbiotic relationship between realism and fantasy, a feature that he attributes to Dickens of all people. He, Dickens, uses a kind of background or setting for his works which is completely naturalistic down to the tiniest details. And on top of this completely naturalistic background, he imposes totally surrealistic images. Because they are so precisely rooted in a recognizable world, fantasy works. In this same interview, Rushdie notes that binary opposition between fantasy and reality may be a perception of the West, rather than the view entertained by the native or post-colonial countries in which these magical texts originated. Speaking of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Rushdie says, one thing that he and I, I think, do have in common is that in India, people don't really treat my story as fantasy. The fantasy elements are relatively minor and are only enabling devices to talk about actuality. I gathered that in South America, 100 years of solitude is also not thought of as fantasy. I think that's quite true about magical realism. What is important about it is that it is realism. Whereas in the West, that is to say America and Europe, both his book and mine have been treated as fantasy. In other words, your position within the global system imperial center or colonial margins, tends to color your perception of magical realism, and whether you emphasize the fantasy or the reality. Toni Morrison has likewise bristled at the categorization of beloved as magical realism for this very same reason. 
African, the African American beliefs uh, expressed in the story are distinctly not magical, but are woven into the social reality of that particular community. In her contribution to magical realism theory and history community, Wendy B. Ferris argues magical realism combines realism and the fantastic in such a way that magical elements grow organically out of the reality portrayed. I'm assuming that Harry Potter, for instance, would not qualify as magical realism due to its shortfall of realism, even though the magic grows somewhat organically out of the reality of its social universe. Ferris also offers a convenient checklist of five primary features of magical realism. That's my fan of white gesture here. <laughs> The text contains an irreducible element of magic, something we cannot explain according to the laws of the universe as we know them. Descriptions detail a strong presence in the phenomenal world. This is the realism in magical realism. Distinguishing it from fantasy and allegory, it appears in several ways. Realistic descriptions create a fictional world that resembles the one we live in, in many instances by extensive use of detail. I'm not sure Dr. Dudley could tell us a little bit more about realism. I'm sure he will ask a horrible question about realism in the <laughs> The reader may hesitate at one point or another between two contradictory understandings or events of events, and hence experiences some unsettling doubt. So for instance, we think of Beloved, and what Beloved actually is. Is she a specter, a ghost, or is she actually just an escaped uh, African-American who's been locked up in a basement? There are rival theories that are going both magical, kind of more realistic. This is kind of what I think Ferris is talking about. Four, we experience the closeness or near merging of two realms, two worlds. The magical realist vision exists at the intersection of two worlds at an imaginary point inside a double-sided mirror that reflects in both directions. Five, these fictions question received ideas about time, space, and identity. Now, we folks working in English departments are programmed to bristle at pigeonholing categories or definitions. But Ferris's essay provides a useful starting point for exploring magical realism. And I throw it out there as suggested reading for our MA and PhD students and our undergraduates as well. Then I want to just briefly talk a little bit about Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie is arguably the most famous living practitioner of magical realism today, although he does not write exclusively within this genre. His most recent novel, The Golden House, published last year, does contain descriptions of a presidential candidate that looks and behaves much like and is indeed called the Joker. Uh, but there is precious little fantasy in this novel and much that is tragically realistic. Over the course of his 45-year career, Rushdie has published 13 novels and one collection of short stories, along with two memoirs and two collections of essays. He was born in Bombay in 1947, about two months prior to independence, uh, to very liberal, non-practicing Muslim parents, much like the protagonist of Midnight's Children, Selim. But he was sent to England to attend school at the age of 14, where he says he experienced racial discrimination for the first time. He then attended Cambridge, where he graduated with an MA in history in 1968. He moved back with his parents uh, to Pakistan for a year, but grew frustrated with censorship when his teleplay adaptation of Edward Albee's zoo story for the new government operated television station was censored for containing the word pork. Uh, he returned to England, worked in advertising, and began writing. His first novel, was, uh, Rhymus, was published in 1973. The other important uh, item to discuss uh, in Rushdie's career is, of course, the fatwa, or the death sentence placed upon him by the Ayatollah Khomeini on Valentine's Day, 1989, the insult to Muslims everywhere in his recently published book, The Satanic Verses. Rushdie was forced into hiding for years while riots, book burnings, bombings, and assassinations of translators and publishers rocked America, Great Britain, Japan, Italy, Norway, and India. The furor over the novel eventually subsided, and Rushdie emerged battered as one might expect, uh, but ultimately unrepentant, a defender of writers and an outspoken critic of religious fundamentalism of all writers. So now I want to talk a little bit about magical realism. The origin of the term magical realism goes back to a uh, German art critic by the name of Franz Rowe, uh, who wrote in 1925 about promising direction in post-expressionist painting. 
we call magic realism. That isn't quite what we're talking about. Uh, we get closer with Alejo Carpentier. In the prologue to his 1949 novel, Kingdom of the World, he describes a marvelous American reality in which the fantastic <coughs> appears in the natural and human realities of time and place where impossible juxtapositions and marvelous mixtures exist by virtue of Latin America's very history, geography, demography, and politics. Thus, magical realism was floating in the ether well before the advent of postmodernism. The link between magical realism and postmodernism was forged by American novelist John Barth. In his 1979 manifesto for postmodernist fiction, The Literature of Replenishment, in this essay, Barth claims postmodernist fiction should aspire to the technical virtuosity of high modernism while democratically reaching beyond the professional devotees of high art. One of the key characteristics of his ideal postmodernist fiction is that it should delight, signaling a clear break from modernism's difficulty of access. Barth does not dismiss modernism by any stretch but rather acknowledges that its rewards are hard-earned. As he notes, if modernist works are often forbidding and require a fair amount of help and training to appreciate, it does not follow that they are not superbly rewarded, as climbing Mount Matterhorn or sailing a small boat around the world. His principal exhibit for demonstrating what postmodernist fiction should be is Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, quintessential magical realist text, and his introduction, Barthes, is so lavish and illuminating its praise that it's worth quoting at length. And that's what I've provided up here, which you probably already read, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Here, the synthesis of straightforwardness and artifice, realism and magic and myth, political passion and non political artistry, characterization and caricature, humor and terror are so remarkably sustained that one recognizes with exhilaration very early on that one is in the presence of a master not only artistically admirable, but humanly wise, lovable, literally marvelous. One had almost forgotten that new fiction could be so wonderful, as well as so nearly important. And the question whether my uh, program for postmodernism is achievable goes happily out the window, like one of Garcia Marquez's characters on flying carpets. Modernism produced important texts. Which, to cite one example, namely William Carlos Williams writing about T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, was like an atom bomb dropped on modern poetry. Hardly lovely. Maybe not delightful. Definitely important. In contrast, the delights of Garcia's no Marquez's novel are many. But as my seminar students have pointed out, it is not without its flaws. Which would include misogyny, incest, pedophilia, and prostitution. Nevertheless, Barth's admiration for this magical realist novel and his program for postmodernism lies in his return, or in the return to storytelling without sacrificing the artistry so abundantly on display in modernist texts, modernist writers such as James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and William Faulkner. In modern epic the world system to Garcia Marquez, Franco Moretti echoes Barth's assessment of 100 Years of Solitude, claiming that its appeal lies in its return to narrative, an avant-garde work but with a gripping story. Modernism is obsessed with kind of formalism, experimentation, language. The painting of modernism is, is fascinated with the individual brushstroke, with colors, with form, not with kind of representational art or what have you. So here we have a return to story, to narrative. Moreover, Moretti suggests that 100 Years of Solitude heals what Adorno calls the great divide between modernism and mass culture. In this formulation, Moretti reinforces, here it is, waiting, what Frederick Jameson <laughs> claims is a fundamental feature of postmodernism, namely the effacement of the older, essentially high modernist frontier behind between high culture and so-called mass or commercial culture, and the emergence of new kinds of texts confused with the forms, categories, and contents of that very culture and industry so passionately denounced by all the ideologues of the modern. I just want you to hold on to this infusion of forms of the culture industry, because I think that's what we're going to see with the next children. <clears throat> well, 100 Years of Solitude 
bridges the divide between high and low culture. Garcia Marquez's novel does so from a curiously marginal position within the world system of multinational capitalism, a topic that Moretti explains in more detail. As the unexpected result of the Inquisition's banning of the sale of European novels in Latin America, this censorship uh, allowed pre-naturalistic narrative forms such as myths, legends, romances of chivalry to survive. And these literary holdovers allowed the extraordinary, the monstrous, the miracle, in a word, adventure, to occupy the center of the picture. The colonial encounter then between a region still steeped in myth <coughs> and the rational West created conditions of possibility for magical realism. Thus, the uneven development of Macondo, or Latin America in general, helps to explain Jose Arcadia Buendia's astonishment at ice, magnets, magnifying glasses, daguerreotypes, and player pianos. In short, the products of science and technology, while what we consider to be the magic, the flying carpets, seem mundane. The appeal of magical realism in the West, according to Moretti, lies in this re-enchantment of the Western world. And so the literature of replenishment that Barth endorses looks an awful lot like cultural appropriation, a rehashing of colonial relations under the guise of eating the other, to use Mel Hooks' term. Magical realism becomes the spice that livens up the dull dish of mainstream white culture, hence the success in movies like, like Water for Chocolate, for instance. In the influential wake of the Nobel Prize winning Garcia Marquez, Salman Rushdie assumed the mantle of magical realist in chief with Midnight's Children which won the best of the Booker Prize in 1993 for the best novel in the 25-year history of the Booker Prize. The story follows Celine Sinai, who was born at midnight on August 15, 1947, at precisely the same moment of the independence of India. As a result, Celine is handcuffed to history, as he explains, my destiny is indissolubly chained to those of my country. His fate reflects the nation's fate, although at times he takes credit for shaping Indian history. Sort of a Forrest Gump kind of like thing going on, except meaningful and good. <laughs> <laughs> the magic of this magical realist lot now relies in the fact that the 100 or 1,001 children born in the first hour of the nation are endowed with magical powers, such as, quote, the ability of stepping into mirrors and reemerging through any reflective surface of the land or changing genders by immersing herself in water. After a transformative accident in a washing chest, Celine discovers he has the power of telepathy. The inner monologues of all the so-called teeming millions, he says, of masses and classes alike jostle for space within my head. His ability to read the thoughts of those around him, especially his family members, causes him no end of trouble. When he announces to his family that he believes the archangels are speaking to him inside his head, his father smacks him and permanently damages his hearing in one ear. Eventually, he learns to harness his power to communicate telepathically with the rest of the Midnight's children in his head. The story builds from the simultaneous birth of Salim and the nation of India to a climax with a state of emergency declared by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi which lasted from 1975 to 1977. If the curious effect of magical realism in the early pages of 100 Years of Solitude revolves around the inversion of technological givens being taken as fascinating mysteries and magical occurrences treated as the most everyday things, then Midnight's Children represents a departure from that formula. Parvati's magical abilities, for instance, are treated like magic and she fears being ostracized, or worse, as a witch. Moreover, the technology and cultural forms of the West are fully integrated into the Indian social reality, not surprisingly, perhaps, for a country famous for Bollywood. In Garcia Marquez, for instance, movies produce riots when actors killed in one film reappear later in a different film. In Rushdie, by contrast, <coughs> Salim Sinai's uncle is a film director. <coughs> His aunt is a ravishing actress, and his neighbor is a movie producer. Mass culture permeates the novel, from metaphors about historical perspective to the very forms in which Celine narrates his life. Exhibit one. Here, Celine 
uh, compares our perspective history to the spectator experience of the film. Reality is a question of perspective. The further you get from the past, the more concrete and plausible it seems. As you approach the present, it inevitably seems more and more incredible. Suppose yourself in a large cinema, sitting at first in the back row and gradually moving up, row by row until your nose is almost pressed against the screen. Gradually, the star's faces dissolve into dancing gray. Tiny details assume grotesque proportions. The illusion dissolves, or rather becomes clear, the illusion itself is reality. This passage demonstrates one of the ways in which the novel may be identified as historiographic metafiction. By kind of problematizing what we mean by the past and how we construct that past. And therefore, it might be affiliated with postmodernism through a different route, as I will argue later. However, here the experience of cinema is a given. It is not a strange. It is not defamiliarized. Obviously, Rushdie's uh, novel takes place much later than the principal action of Marquez's classic, but the difference is telling. Of course, movies in Midnight's Children can still produce shock, but not riots. Salim's filmmaker uncle has a, quote, spectacular though brief period of triumph, unquote, Unquote, with, a not, uh, with a film called The Lovers of Kashmir, notable for its subversion of film codes through <coughs> indirect kiss. In those days, it was not permitted for lover boys and their leading ladies to touch one another on screen for fear that their oscillations might corrupt the nation's youth. But 33 minutes after the beginning of The Lovers, the premiere audience began to give off a low buzz of shock because Pia and Nile had begun to kiss not one another things. Pia kissed an apple, sensuously, with all the rich fullness of her painted lips, and passed it to Naya, who planted upon its opposite face a virally passionate Later, Selene recognizes the disguised courtship behavior while spying on his mother when she meets her ex-husband Nadir, or Nadir, at the Pioneer Cafe, a hub for film extras and communists. This is just a picture from the actual film adaptation of Rushdie wrote, uh, produced a couple years ago. What I saw at the very end, my mother's hand raising a half-empty glass of lovely lassie, my mother's lips pressing gently, nostalgically against the model glass, my mother's hands handing the glass to her neither Cassim, who also applied to the opposite side of the glass his own poetic mouth. So it was that life imitated bad art, my uncle Honey's sister brought the eroticism of the indirect kiss into the green neon dinginess Pioneer Cafe. My point? Rushdie's use of film in Midnight's Children is postmodern insofar as it fully incorporates the various forms of the culture industry into its very substance. The incorporation of Western cinema in Indian culture may be viewed negatively as the result of cultural imperialism with its accompanying decadent secular values. However, the Indian film industry seems independent and perfectly capable of creating its own forms. Uh, such as the aforementioned Bollywood. As Ajiz Ahmad argues, viewing India only in terms of its colonial past misses the way in which India has been integrated in the world uh, system of multinational capitalism. Well, I digress. One episode in particular demonstrates that the cultural circuit between India and the West certainly travels both ways. In the chapter Revelations, Selim describes how his childhood friend from Malabar Hill, Cyrus Dubash, was transformed into India's richest guru, Lord Kuzro Kuzrivan Bagwa, by his religious fanatic mother. His origin tale bears a striking resemblance to another origin tale with which we should be familiar. A noble Joral and beauteous Kalila were wise, sacrificing themselves in an ecstasy of Kundalini art, they saved the soul of their unborn son, Lord Kuzro, entering true oneness in a supreme yogic trance whose powers are now accepted in the whole world. They transform their noble spirits into a flashing beam of kundalini life force energy light, of which today's well-known laser is a common imitation and copy. Along this beam, soul of unborn Kuzro flew, traversing the bottomless deeps of celestial space eternity, until by our luck, it came to our own dunya world, and lodged in womb of humble Parsi matron of good family. So does anybody recognize this? Jor-El? Cal el No. Yeah, Superman. 
The origin story is basically Superman. Indeed, Selene takes responsibility for the creation of this most successful holy child in history. In payment for a female anatomy lesson making use of a marble statue of a female nude owned by Cyrus, Selene gave Cyrus a copy of that most precious of Superman comics, the one containing the framed story about the explosion of the planet Krypton and the rocket ship in which Jor-El, his father, dispatched him through space to land on Earth and be adopted by the good Ralph Kent's. Salim observes that what Mrs. Dubash had done was to rework and reinvent the most potent of all modern works, <coughs> the legend of coming in Superman. In the figure of Lord Kuzro, hybridity enacts a simple strategy of cultural exploitation. Now, we will temporarily put on hold the question of how hybridity works in the nice children. There's one more thing about the description of Lord Kuzro that I want to dwell on just a moment to illustrate kind of mass culture and high culture interaction, and that is. Listen to this line. Speaking of Lord Kuzro, in no time at all he was being hailed by crowds half a million strong and credited with miracles. American guitarists came to sit at his feet and they all brought their checkbooks along. <laughs> the illusion here is to the Indian trip of the Beatles in February 1968 to study transcendental meditation under the guidance of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Other famous attendees of the Guru's ashram and Rishikesh included Donovan, uh, Mike Love of the Beach Boys, and Mia Farrow. Uh, John Lennon wrote Dear Prudence uh, at the ashram for Mia's sister, Prudence, who was isolating herself from the others through prolonged meditation. The novel playfully conjures India's reputation for spiritual enlightenment in the West and debunks the myth, a move that may also be seen in Hanif uh, Qureshi's celebrated novel of Buddha of Suburbia. Basically, Mrs. Dubash cynically sets her son up to be a master, the guru with all of the answers to life enduring mysteries. But as Jacques Lacan contends, the master is an imposter, relying on gullible individuals to treat him as the subject it's supposed to know. What are the debates surrounding postmodernism in regards to its relationship to history? His landmark essay, Postmodernism and the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, Jameson argues that postmodernism is characterized by the waning of historicity, or lived possibility of experiencing history in some active way. Jameson points to the emergence of the nostalgia film, such as American Graffiti, as the principal symptom of this loss of historical sense, in which we, rep or in which we witness the desperate attempt to appropriate a missing past the iron law of fashion change and the emergent ideology of the generation. The postmodern condition even renders the historical novel impossible, according to Jameson. The historical novel can no longer set out to represent the historical past. It can only represent our ideas and stereotypes about the past, which thereby at once becomes pop history. And we're back with Forrest Gump. Our current obsession with everything that's wrong with millennials, we think in generational terms, right? And the blatant nostalgia for the 1980s and Stranger Things and other texts kind of lends support to what Jameson, I think, is saying in this argument. However, in both the poetics of postmodernism and the politics of postmodernism, Linda Hutchin disputes Jameson's claims that postmodernism is ace-historical through her spirited defense of historiographic metafiction. Prevailing interpretation is that postmodernism offers a value-free, Decorative, dehistoricized quotation of past forms, and that this is the most apt mode for a culture like our own that is oversaturated with images. Instead, I would want to argue that postmodern parody is a value problematizing, denaturalizing form of acknowledging the history, irony, the politics, of representation. Borrowing a page from the playbook of historian Hayden White. Hutchin argues that historiographic metafiction refutes the natural or common sense methods of distinguishing between historical fact and fiction. It refuses the view that only history has a truth claim, both by questioning the ground of that claim in historiography and by asserting that both history and fiction are discourses, human constructs, signifying systems, and both derive their major claims from that identity. For Hutchin, historiographic metafiction is exemplified by novels such as Robert Cooper's The Public Burning, ELO, 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 Electrical Light Orchestra, Dr. That's not right. ELO, Dr. and Sam Rushdie's The Next Show. 
I would like to examine uh, this debate over the representation of history between Janus and Hutchin in Rushdie's treatment of the emergency declared by Indira Gandhi in 1975, and which lasted until she called for elections in 1977 and lost. I believe that this episode encapsulates the threads of postmodernism I have attempted to articulate today, the blending of high and low culture and the practice of historiographic metafiction. Before embarking on this analysis, however, we should probably familiarize ourselves with the history of the emergency, and I apologize in advance for the historical minutia of this summary, but these facts are all relayed in Midnight's Children. They are all there. In 1973 to 1974, democracy was in crisis in India in a manner that unfortunately resonates today. A protest movement against an unpopular and allegedly corrupt state government in Gujarat was gaining national momentum behind the influential figure of Jayaprakash Narayan, or JP, uh, who publicly feuded with Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. There was a massive railroad strike that paralyzed the country for weeks. In early 1975, Indira Gandhi was charged with campaign finance violations, stemming from a 1971 parliamentary election, specifically for spending more money than was allowed and by using in her campaign the official machinery and officials in government service. She became the first Indian Prime Minister to testify in court on March 19, 1975. The verdict came down on June 12, 1975, and she was acquitted on 12 of 14 counts. But the two minor violations made her election to Parliament null and void. She was found guilty, get this, of using a really high roster to address political gatherings from a dominating position. And, a little more seriously perhaps, employing a government official as her election agent when the campaign began. She was granted a 20-day stay in order to appeal the decision to the Supreme Court. Once the Supreme Court began hearing uh, her appeal, the Supreme Court pronounced that Indira Gandhi could attend Parliament, but could not vote there until her appeal was fully heard and pronounced on. Calls for her resignation came not surprisingly from the opposition, but also from her own party. Nevertheless, Sanjay Gandhi, Gandhi, her son, urged her not to resign. Instead, on June 25, 1975, Indira Gandhi declared a state of emergency, giving her almost unlimited powers, and she acted quickly to reinforce her position. As Indian historian Ramachandra Gua explains, the clampdown was swift. Quote, the night, that night, the power supply to all of Delhi's newspaper offices was switched off, so there were no additions on June 26th. The police swooped down on the opposition leaders, taking JP, Maraji Desai, and many others off to, date, off to jail, and all civil rulers were suspended. Gua notes that any group that opposed the ruling party was targeted for arrest and sent to already overcrowded jails <coughs> under the Maintenance of, in, you know, of Internal Security Act. Estimates suggest that MISA, as the act became known, led to the imprisonment of 36,000 people. By July, Gandhi passed amendments to the Constitution that barred judicial review of the emergency and prevented the Supreme Court from challenging the election of the Prime Minister. Censorship of the press prevented any articles critical of the government or reports on processions, strikes, political opposition, or conditions in the jail. Later, Parliament stripped journalists of immunity while covering Parliament, and as many as 253 journalists were placed under arrest. Nepotism also ran rampant under Indira, the shades of the Trump administration. And her son Sanjay was given Delhi to run, kind of as a preliminary to his political career down the line. Gua notes that two of the primary goals of his five-point program were family planning and slum clearance. Sanjay's methods were brutal. Bulldozers were employed to, were employed to plow through and destroy slum dwellings. In April 1976, protests, protests erupted over the clearing of the Turkmen Gate area of the Old City. After formal appeals to the government failed to halt the bulldozers, a group of women and children squatted on the road and defied bulldozers to run over them. Horrifyingly, the family planning element of Sanjay's program was even worse than the slum, slum clearance methods, as the occupants of the slums were dragged off to sterilization camps. Sanjay evidently set sterilization goals for the Indian states and encouraged competition between them to see who could perform the most operations. Worse of means were used to twist the arms of the law to the citizens. Teachers wouldn't get paychecks, etc. 
until they submit it to sterilization truck drivers when you get licenses until they submit it. All this stuff is what is going on. Confident that her nation would validate her rule, Indira Gandhi announced elections in January. Oops, I missed my Sanjay slide. Uh, confident that her nation would invalidate or would validate her rule, Indira Gandhi announced elections in January 1977. Opposition parties formed the coalition Janata Party and trounced Indira and Sanjay in the March 20th, 20, 1977 election. The emergency was over. In Midnight's Children, these historical details of the emergency are faithfully recounted in Salim's narration. But the representation of Indira Gandhi borrows elements from the Wicked Witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. Indeed, the first glimpse we get of the widow occurs during a fever dream of Selene's. Not unlike Dorothy's dream while she lay unconscious, as we learn at the end of the film, when she awakens to find Auntie M tending to her and suffer concussion. <coughs> no colors, except green and black. The walls are green, the sky is black, there is no roof. The stars are green, the widow is green, but her hair is black as black. The widow sits on a high, high chair. The chair is green, the seat is black. The widow's hair has a center party. It is green on the left and on the right black. High as the sky, the chair is green, the seat is black, the widow's arm is long as death, the skin is green, the fingernails are long and sharp and black. Between the walls, the children green, the walls are green, the widow's arm comes snaking down, the snake is green, the children scream, the fingernails are black. They scratch the widow's arms, arms hunting to see the children run and scream. The widow's hand curls around them, green and black. And Dear Gandhi's uh, center part of hair, black and white, is changed to green. And black, but the dream logic governing the construction of the widow blends high and low culture. The popular images from the Wizard of Oz with a stream of consciousness narration straight out of Faulkner or Joyce. Historical details are cleverly smuggled into the dream. Does the high, high chair refer to the dominatingly high rock strip for which Indira was convicted of a campaign violation? Like everything in Midnight's Children, the emergency is handcuffed to Selim. His wife Parvati goes into labor at the precise moment on June 12, 1975, that Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was found guilty of two counts of campaign malpractice during the election campaign in 1971. Parvati endures an agonizing labor that lasts 13 days, the same 13 days that saw the Prime Minister refusing to resign, although her convictions carried with them a mandatory penalty barring her from public office for six years. The novel links Parvati's labor pains to the mounting tensions in India regarding Indira's position. Quoting, on the ninth day, we could not hear Maharaji Ghazai calling on President Ahmad to sack the disgraced Prime Minister, and the only sounds in the entire world were the ruined whimperings of Parvati Leila as the contractions piled upon her like mountains. By the twelfth day, Indira Gandhi's political opponents were pushing her, and she pushed back while Parvati was expending the last of her strength to push her baby out. And so Adam Sinai, Sinai's son, uh, technically it's his rival, Shiva's son, with whom he was switched to birth, it's very convoluted, uh, was born at midnight on June 25th, 1975, at the precise instant of India's arrival at emergency. Parvati gave a final pitiable little yelp, and out he popped, while all over India policemen were arresting people. All opposition leaders, except members of the pro Moscow communists, and also school teachers, low lawyers, poets, newspaper men, trade unionists. In fact, anyone who had ever made the mistake of sneezing during the Mad Adams speeches. Before we lose the forest for the trees here, let's take a step back and try to figure out how the story works and relates to the rival theories of postmodernism proposed by Jameson and Hutchinson. First question, do historical references that contextualize the narrative as belonging to a particular time and place constitute what Hutchin calls historiographic metafiction? The answer is obviously no. For instance, you know, my mom loves reading historical romances uh, regarding Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, right? Books that are loaded with historical references, invoking the period. But they do not question the very construction of that history. They are historical without being historiographic. Question two, 
Does the plentiful use of historical references represent the historical sense Jameson claims to give lost to the cultural logic of late capitalism? No, for the simple reason that a low of detail does not necessarily lead to the lived possibility of experiencing history in some actual way. However, Maggie Ann Bowers, in her book on magical realism, that critical idiom series, much like Dr. Robertson presented with the Gothic, contends that that is exactly what Midnight's Children does. And that Jameson suggests is impossible today. Namely, Selim sees himself as, or Selim himself, is being forced to think historically through the circumstances of his birth at a time when the country of India is leaving its colonial history behind and forming its own national identity. <laughs> The historical references to the various wars of India and Pakistan and the emergency are supplemented by what could almost be called cognitive mapping. The aesthetic program of making sense of the individual's position within the social totality that Jameson advances is the proper work of art today. Well, at least in 1991 when the essay was written. In Midnight's Children, the magical elements of the novel are offset by the gritty realistic details of Indian poverty that illuminate the social totality. Such as the shop, the comfortably bourgeois Amina Amna Sanai experiences when she goes into the slums of Bombay to have her poem read. Quote, when you have city eyes, you cannot see the invisible people. The men with the elephant tigers and the balls and the beggars in boxcars don't impinge upon you. My mother lost her city eyes, and the newness of what she was seeing made her flush. Newness like a hailstorm pricking her cheeks. Class, there is its ugly head here as it does later, with Selim's snakes and ladders like descent from the bourgeoisie into the lumpen proletariat to the magician's camp. He enters the company of communists and joins their cause primarily because it is now his cause. But Midnight's Children provides a textbook example of Hutchins' claims regarding historiographic metafiction. Selim's atrocity-laden vision or version of the emergency clashes with government accounts and therefore calls into question official history. As Bowers argues, uh, as Bowers argues, many magical realist works include historical references not only to situate the text in a particular context, but also to bring into question already existing historical assumptions. In fact, postmodernist thinking about history usually emphasizes the lack of absolute historical truth and casts doubt over the existence of fact by indicating its link to narrative stories. Nowhere in Hershey's novel is this point made more clearly than in his concluding remarks about Pakistan's electoral fraud. In a country where the truth is what is instructed to be, reality quite literally ceases to exist, so that everything becomes possible except what we are told is the case. And maybe this was the difference between my Indian childhood and Pakistani adolescence, that in the first, I was beset by an infinity of alternative realities while in the second I was adrift, disorientated, amid an equally infinite number of falsenesses, unrealities, and lies. Sadly, we are discovering, as Selim acknowledges, nobody, no country, has a monopoly of untruth. Thank you.